Okay, welcome. We can get started. Welcome to the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center of Nassau County's Curator's Corner. I'm Thorin Tritter, the Museum and Programming Director. Um, this online program, as many of you know, is part of a weekly series that we started where we delve into particular objects in our collection when the building's closed. I hope all of you are staying healthy um, and, uh, and all well. Let me encourage you before I jump in further to pose any questions you have on the Q&A or with the Q&A function on your computer screen. I will probably not get to the, the Q&A until the end, but if you've got questions that come up, please type them in. Today, I want to focus on a letter that's displayed in our gallery from a soldier who wrote home shortly after having seen the recently liberated camp of Buchenwald in 1945. I thought, I thought that this soldier's account might be particularly apt for this week, given that we just celebrated Flag Day this past weekend, which was also the anniversary of the establishment of the U.S. Army. And while I'm not talking about a flag today, it seemed appropriate to talk about an example of a soldier who fought under the American flag and whose efforts during World War II safeguarded this country. Here's a picture of the exhibit case in our museum that shows this letter as we display it, uh, and a photograph of the author, <clears throat> Jim Van Ralt, a radio operator who served in the 3103rd Signal Service Battalion. This is a slightly cleaner view of the items on display. They were donated to the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center by Jim Van Rout before he passed away in 2010. And we are very grateful for his donation and to his family who kindly shared additional information about his service history. Before I delve into the letter, let me say a word about Jim Van Rout. He enlisted in the US Army on January 13th, 1942, about a month after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. He was a few months shy of his 22nd birthday at the time and had been attending Brown University with his twin brother, Tom. Jim's brother urged Jim to go with him to officer candidate school. In the end, Jim, Jim's brother became an officer and served in North Africa, but Jim didn't complete OCS and instead joined the Signal Corps, initially stationed at Fort Monmouth in New Jersey. After two years of first learning to be a radio operator and then working to teach and train others uh, about how to use the radios, Jim shipped off for England in January of 1944. Jim's son Gregory told me that his father claimed that he had pissed off his commanding officer at Fort Monmouth and so was punished by being sent to the, to the European theater. Perhaps that's true, but it was also the case that in late 1943 and early 1944, America began to gear up for the proposed D-Day invasion, gradually moving its forces over to England. Once in England, the 3103rd Signal Battalion was tasked with one of the most elaborate hoaxes of the war, becoming part of the non-existent first U.S. Army group. FUSAG, as they were known, was a fake army, led by the real General George Patton, but it was part of Operation Fortitude, which sought to deceive the Germans about where the cross-channel attack would be directed. The goal was to convince the Germans that the first U.S. Army group, which again didn't actually exist, was the main strike force, and that it would attack across the channel at Calais, in the summer of 1944. Meanwhile, of course, the real plan was to attack at Normandy. If you saw my program last week when I spoke about the Ghost Army and their efforts to deceive the Germans in various campaigns in Europe, then this may sound familiar. But FUSAG was really the pioneer in deception that would later be sustained by the Ghost Army. And crucial to the deception for the D-Day invasion was the effort of Jim Van Ralt's 3103rd Signal Battalion. His job was to send encrypted shortwave Morse code messages day and night that the Germans would intercept and believe were part of a massive troop buildup preparing to cross at the narrowest point of the English Channel. The day before D-Day, 
On Monday, the 5th of June, 1944, Jim was sent out into the English Channel as part of our armada of small boats that sent out radio signals and appeared to be an invasion fleet heading to Calais. But as we know, or and as we know, the deception worked. The Germans became certain that the attack would come to Calais, bunching their forces there and leaving Normandy less well defended for the attack that came the following day. Jim would later cross into the continent fighting in the Battle of the Bulge in the winter of 90, 1944 and crossing into Germany in the spring of 1945. It was at the end of April 1945 that he wrote the letter we have on display back to his parents in, the, in New York. We show the final two pages of the letter in the gallery, but it's actually a five page single spaced letter that he later enhanced with two photographs. And it's essentially all about the immediate aftermath of the liberation of Buchenwald. Gregory Van Ralt, Jim's son, told me that he once asked his father why he had been at Buchenwald, but he never got a very detailed answer. It may have been because there was a radio broadcasting tower near the camp and he was sent there by the signal battalion. But it may also have been because as soon as American troops reached Buchenwald and its various subcamps, word quickly spread about the infamous conditions there. General Eisenhower famously visited the subcamp at Ordruf on April 12th, eight days after its liberation, and proceeded to encourage both German civilians to visit to show them what they had pretended was not happening, and American soldiers to see what they were fighting for. Another member of Jim's company, a guy named U.S. Cleveland, later recalled that they were stationed not far from Buchenwald near the end of the war, and he decided to go check it out. He explained, Allied commanders were letting American forces see firsthand what the Germans had done. We went in and looked around. We couldn't believe our eyes, he said. The place was sickening. Jim tried to describe what he saw to his parents in his letter, but he wrote at the opening that his description would not capture what he had seen. I will try and describe it to you, he said, but bear in mind always how inadequate words are, how completely beyond description this whole thing is. After saying he hoped that the government officials would share information with the American public, he added, everyone should know just what has happened in these camps. But again, <clears throat> the mere telling of the thing is so inadequate. It must be seen. Because of the horror he had seen, <coughs> he said people might not want to look at photographs from the camp. But he emphasized that certainly the wrong attitude. People must force themselves to see these pictures. And let me mention here before I go on that some of Jim Van Ralt's description is graphic and unpleasant. But the whole point of his letter was to try and convey the details and the horror. And so I won't relate everything from the letter, but I also don't want to pull any punches. And so I warn you that I'll be sharing with you some highly disturbing parts of this letter. Let me step back. Oh, oops. Let me step back and say that Buchenwald had been established by the Nazis in 1937. So it's one of the earliest camps that was built. And it was located just outside, about five miles outside of the city of Weimar. It initially was used mostly to hold political prisoners who were put to work as forced laborers. But after the so-called Kristallnacht pogrom of 1938, about 10,000 Jews were sent there. And later, both Russian and American POWs were interred at Buchenwald for some time. By February of 1945, Buchenwald and its elaborate system of 88 subcamps held more than 112,000 prisoners. As the American liberators approached in April of 1945, the Nazis evacuated some 28,000 prisoners from the main camp, but the Americans still found at least 21,000 who had been left behind and who had managed to overpower the remaining guards before the Allied troops arrived. The Americans also found records showing that between 1937 and 1945, the SS had imprisoned 250,000 people in Buchenwald, murdering some 56,000 men 
through starvation, hard labor, and killings. The entrance to Buchenwald still stands today as part of the memorial that was created there. And the clock at the top of the entrance, which you can see here, is permanently set to 3.15 p.m. That's the time that the U.S. 6th Army Division of the 3rd Army arrived at 11, uh, on April 11, 1945. Jim Van Ralt described the camp and the prisoners in his letter. How did these prisoners look? Here's where adequate description, he said, becomes hard. They were ghostly looking. Every bone in their bodies seemed to stick out. Bony hand, bony legs, bony faces, eyes black and deeply sunken, skin sallow and pale. Here was a strange, new and horrible world, he said, where skeletons actually walked, though the walk was feeble and unsteady. And where living corpses, happy at being free, grateful to us, but too weak to show any signs of their happiness. Jim went on to describe how he found a former prisoner to guide him through the camp. He said, I soon got to talking with a prisoner from Belgium who spoke French. And he offered to show us around. There were about five of us. I was the interpreter. I did, a, I did damn well too. He also described some of the punishments. Oh, sorry, so, so he told some of the, how the prisoners were dressed. The Jewish prisoners, he said, wore flimsy flannel gray suit with light blue stripes. The only other bit of clothing they wore were shabby, overcoats and jackets, the remains of the clothes they were captured in. The others were just plain rags. It could hardly be called clothing. He also described some of the punishments and torture that the Nazis inflicted on prisoners. Um, the Krauts also hung, just making sure, hung people. But death was not so sweet and quick as you'd think it would be. They didn't hang these people in the ordinary manner, he said. It was so fixed that when these people were hung, it took them from seven to 10 minutes to die. Our guide told us how they were forced to view these hangings, how all they could do was stand by helplessly and watch their fellow prisoners die a slow and horrible death. Jim then described the crematoria at Buchenwald, four huge furnaces where the bodies were thrown in and burned. Jim said their guide showed us then a sight which I shall never forget as long as I live, a sight which any hardened GI would blink and squint at and say, good God. It was a tremendous yard which would cover a good city block in length and width. At one time, the bodies of prisoners waiting to be burned were thrown here like so much garbage in a pile eight or nine feet high, completely covering the whole yard. It was a horrible sight. The famine and hunger that plagued these people was easily seen. The evidence of beatings and other forms of cruel treatment was also visible. Broken legs, deep wounds to the bone, smashed in heads, he goes on. And then he wrote, upon each and every one of the bodies was a look of intense horror, suffering and pain which bear mute testimony to the criminal acts that were committed by these mad lunatics. His letter continues with descriptions of the barracks and the supposed hospital, which he says included no medicine and was so crowded that it could not have helped but be an incubator of disease. But there are two final pages, where, which are the ones we actually show in our gallery. On the first of these pages, uh, he talks about the food that was given to the prisoners. In the morning, he said, they had a cup of coffee. At noon, they had a piece of bread the size of your index finger and a cup of soup. And at night, a cup of soup only. On this diet, it took more than physical strength to live, he said. 
it took guts and a hope for the future. Jim's guide, he said, had starved so long that even though he was hungry, he was unable to eat anything. Then Jim hinted at the mental toll that the Nazi starvation had left in its wake. His guide, Jim wrote, showed us a little disc that prisoners had to have in order to get meals. Sometimes a prisoner would lose his and would try to steal one from another. He therefore made it a habit to grasp his steel disc, which hung around his neck from a chain, continually. He did so even while he took us around. That little disc meant a prolongation of life, but only a prolongation for every prisoner, Jim wrote, was slated to die. Jim then turned to the scale of the death that he saw all around him. He reported that in the previous month, 2,000 prisoners had died, and on average, 675 people died every day. In response to these deaths, as soon as the camp was liberated, the survivors erected one of the first memorials to the victims of the Holocaust, which Jim saw and described. I saw a monument made out of cardboard and boxes and cloth made by the prisoners after the Americans overran the place, he wrote. It was about 20 feet high. And at the top were the figures neatly carved in wood, 51,000 in memory of the 51,000 people who had died there. Jim took a photograph that he later added to his letter. Here's a blow up of the image. The initials are meant to be KLB, although I know it looks to me like it says HLB. The letters are an abbreviation in German for Concentration Lager Buchenwald. It turns out that the prisoner's early estimate was not far from the truth. As I mentioned later, research showed that some 56,000 people died at Buchenwald. I should add that the temporary monument was replaced by a more permanent structure later on. So Jim's photograph and the few others that exist are really the very few examples of this initial, initial effort to memorialize the victims. There's one last part of Jim's letter that I wanted to share. It's how he closed his letter. They are bringing civilians around now to view all this mess, he wrote. People who lived a stone's throw away from all of this. Their reaction, they weep at what they see, claiming they never knew this kind of thing existed. Then in capital letters, Jim wrote, trying to convey his own anger. I have seen them cringe and want to be let out. The sight is too horrible for them. Just think of that. Imagine intentional murderers, ruthless killers, crying at the scene of their own crimes. The letter is a powerful first-hand account of Buchenwald shortly after liberation, and we are lucky to have it in our collection. There are three last comments about the letter that I want to close with. First, one of the things that makes this letter so powerful is Jim's own skill at writing. Not everyone's letters home conveyed what they saw in such moving terms. Jim was a gifted writer and was able to translate what he saw into descriptive prose. Another notable aspect of this letter is that Jim was able to capture his own awe at what he saw. And remember, this is a guy who had been in the army for three years by the time he wrote this and had fought at numerous battles, including some of the worst fighting of World War II at the Battle of the Bulge. And yet the horror of what he saw at Buchenwald was worse than what he had seen in any battle. I think his awe is something that should give us pause. And my third thought about the letter is that it highlights how little soldiers knew about what the Nazis were doing, even at the very end of the war. Even though newspapers in the US had information about the mass murder, of Jews in 1943 and the US State Department had confirmed the Nazis' genocidal plan in November of 1942, the American public and US troops were largely unaware of what that genocide looked like in practice. They were also largely unaware of the inhumanity in the thousands of camps that the Nazis had established. 
It was only through firsthand visits, like the one Jim Van Ralt made in Buchenwald in April of 1945, that soldiers came to understand what had been going on. And it was through their letters home, like this letter in our museum, that Americans came to understand what came to be known as the Holocaust. I'm going to stop there. I will admit that this was a difficult letter for me to highlight because of its content. And yet, as Jim wrote in this very letter, looking away and glossing over the details would be dangerous. It is the details in all their horror that help us get closer to understanding something that remains today incomprehensible. So thank you for watching. And of course, if you have questions, please type them in the Q&A box. I'll try to answer them. Let me take a moment to mention some of the um, some of the other upcoming programs we have. On Monday, June 22nd at one o'clock, I hope you'll join us for a program entitled Resilience and Adaptability, Lessons from a Holocaust Survivor as we approach the end of the coronavirus lockdown, which will explore the various challenges that we all face in transitioning away from the lockdown due to the coronavirus. Next Wednesday at 11, I'll hold another Curator's Corner, looking at a photo in our gallery of Holocaust rescuers Andre and Magda Trocmé, who along with other residents of their village in France, saved the lives of thousands during the war. And next Thursday at one o'clock, we'll be offering one of our bi-monthly virtual gallery tours. So I hope you'll join me for those presentations. You can, of course, find a full list of our upcoming programs on our website under the events tab at www.hmtcli.org. And I hope you'll also go to our website and make a donation to support the museum, the Holocaust Memorial, and programs like this. Okay, let me take a look at some of your questions. Um, somebody says she met Jim Van Rolt, and she says he was so evidently traumatized by the witness. I, I, I mean, you get that in this letter. This is a guy who brought this home with him. Uh, how did the experience affect him in later life? I mean, he came home, he became, he got married, he moved out to Port Washington. Uh, he had various businesses. He was a model for a while and then an importer, an exporter. Uh, he had a, a successful life and his children uh, are a, a reminder of that success. Um, how did Jim's guide know so many details about the camp? Jim writes in the letter that his guide was a Jewish prisoner at Buchenwald, originally from Belgium, but he was a survivor of the camp and so knew it very well. Um, did, Tom, uh, did uh, Jim's brother survive? Yes, uh, Tom, Jim's brother also did survive war. So the twins did manage to survive even though they were in very different theaters of the war. There was one point in France I read where um, Jim's commander got a radio message saying uh, for Jim from his brother and saying he was pretty close by. And a couple hours later, Tom showed up and they got a chance to meet. So uh, that was a nice time, but mostly they were apart during the war, but both survived. Um, Jim, somebody mentions that somebody, that Jim spoke to his class at Huntington High School a few years back, many years back, and remembers how he had said he was unprepared for what he saw, and especially the smell of Buchenwald. Thank you for sharing that. Um, uh, finally, somebody asks, how did Jim's family respond to the letter? I, I don't know the details of how the family responded, how his parents responded, but this is something that was repeated, obviously, all across the country as soldiers wrote home and described what they were seeing. And really, it became a significant way about how Americans learned about what was going on during the Holocaust, because people trusted their own children and, and the accounts that they were receiving from them even more than they did from the press. Okay. Thanks very much. Enjoy the rest of your day, and I look forward to seeing you at other programs again soon. Thank you.